Hi, my name is Livia Ratz, and I'm going to talk to you today about how Draper Laboratory made the world's smallest electronic systems. So first of all, why would we have wanted to do that? So making electronics tiny, it's pretty easy for us to understand these days, since we all carry around smartphones and we do all sorts of things with them. The tinier the electronics, the more capability you can squeeze into whatever volume you have. That's kind of the obvious answer. There's also a different answer, which is that when you're designing a system, today, even today, you have to worry about where you're going to put the electronics. But if you can make them so tiny that you simply take them out of the equation and you can design your system based entirely on what you want it to do, that would be the goal. So take, for example, a, a slightly older example, counterexample, if you will, of the desktop computer, where really the parts you interact with are the monitor, the keyboard, and the mouse. And ideally, that would be all. That would be all you would have in your system. And yet, we also have this great big box that sits on the floor, because that's what holds the electronics. So there are analogies in aircraft design, in spacecraft design, and in essentially in making anything that includes electronics. You have to leave space for them. So we here at Draper wanted to think about how we might take the electronics completely out of the design equation. So I'm going to take you back a few years now. This here is an image from 1946. This is the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, or ENIAC for short, and it was the world's first general purpose programmable computer. It was by no means the world's first computer, but it was the first one that was general purpose. And it was designed to do pretty much one thing, which was to calculate artillery range tables, which was the way guns were fired in those days. But in fact, something interesting happened. Because it was a general purpose machine, some mathematicians got a hold of it, and they started using it in ways that the designers didn't foresee. So that's really the first example, the first taste that humanity had, if you will, of what they could do with electronics that was not planned. And where could they take you if you have this incredible capability? Speaking of incredible capability, this machine was capable of doing about 50,000 simple calculations per second. It made a lot of mistakes when it did that, but people were very, very impressed with that capability, and it really was quite revolutionary for its time. But you can see that it took up an entire room. So let's now superimpose on that old picture, last year's picture of an iPhone 5, 66 years later. The iPhone 5 was capable of about 500,000 much more complicated computations per second. But of course, the, its value lies not only in the fact that it could compute more things faster, but in the fact that it's so portable. So we here at Draper, we, we like our numbers, so I'd like to propose a metric, which is number of calculations per second per unit volume. And if we accept that metric, then if we compare the ENIAC of 1946 to the iPhone 5 of 2012, we realize that there has been a capability improvement of 11 orders of magnitude in just 66 years, which is a single lifetime, less than a single lifetime. And we can't even really conceive of 11 orders of magnitude other than, boy, that's a big number. So let's see if I can uh, bring it a little bit down to earth for you. Think about one of your red blood cells, which, as you know, you can't see with the naked eye. You can see it with a microscope. Compare the size of a red blood cell to the height of an average person. That difference is only six orders of magnitude. So in order to get to 11 orders of magnitude, you now have to compare the height of an average person to the distance between here and the sun, which is another distance that we have difficulty picturing. But that's the only way we actually get to 11 orders of magnitude. And yet, we at Draper Lab, we thought we could do better than that. And I bet you could see why. If you break open your smartphone, and you look at the circuit board inside, and you look at the battery, and you look at everything else that's in there, well, everything is squeezed in pretty tightly. But if you can see the circuit board, you'll realize there's actually quite a lot of space left to work with. So, 
If we took all that space and we really squeezed all of the electronics and the sensors together, and we had the transmit-receive capability of the antenna, and we had the battery in there, we thought we could get all of that into the volume that's no bigger than a Scrabble tile. So that's, in fact, what we set out to do. And the reason, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, was that we wanted to take the room that, of the, that the electronics take up completely out of the, the design equation for our customers. So as we were thinking about how we would accomplish that, the key insight that we had was that we really have to get off the circuit board as a platform. And the circuit board is a wonderful thing. It's all over the place. It's completely standard. Anywhere, people can assemble circuit boards. But they were really designed to be cheap and easy to use and easy to work with. They weren't particularly designed to be as tiny as you could possibly make them. So what could we use as a platform that is designed to be as tiny and as efficient as people could possibly make it? Well, we really didn't have to look any further than the silicon wafer, which is, of course, the platform for making the devices themselves that eventually end up on the circuit board. There's a whole industry. The wafer fabrication industry makes tools and equipment that precisely align and pattern very, very tiny features. So we thought if we, could, if we could somehow take advantage of that, we wouldn't have to develop all those machines ourselves. So that's what we set out to do. We actually decided to bury all those components right inside the silicon wafer and trick the processing equipment into thinking that it was processing a run-of-the-mill standard silicon wafer. Now, in order to do that, we not only had to figure out all the process steps to make the silicon wafer the packaging platform, but we had to t get rid of all the plastic that was around those individual components that you normally buy that you use to mount to the, uh, the circuit board. So we tried to buy components without all the plastic, and many times we were successful, and many times we had to figure out how to take the component out using some exotic chemistries. And finally, some components, even if you took them out of the plastic, were just too big. They weren't ever going to fit inside the silicon wafer. So in those cases, we had to do our own research, and we had to invent those components completely from scratch in order to get everything buried inside that wafer. So there were a lot of inherent challenges in all of this, and I'm just going to highlight one of them. Here you see a picture of an, of an early so-called reconstructed wafer, and I'm going to highlight the problem of the glue. So here we have a whole bunch of little components. They're very, very thin. They fit inside a silicon wafer but they have to be held together in that wafer. And there's a property of materials called the thermal expansion coefficient, which is simply the measure of how much a material expands and contracts in response to changes in temperature. And when you pack materials together very tightly that have different thermal expansion coefficients, they eventually just break. So we had to find a material that acted like glue and yet had a thermal expansion coefficient that was small enough that it could play well with the silicon. And we found a material that did do that, but it was so difficult to work with that we had to build our own piece of equipment, which was a special injection molder that molded everything together and made the surface so flat and so smooth that all those pieces of equipment thought that they were processing just a regular silicon wafer. At the time, this was a completely revolutionary concept, and now it's fairly widespread. You'll hear wafer fabs talk about the reconstructed wafer process that is used in commercial fabrication and packaging houses all over the world now. Once we had everything molded right into the silicon wafer, we then patterned the wires. And here you can see some pictures of some of the wires. These are ex early examples, superimposed on the nib of a fountain pen, which allows you to see just how small those features ended up being. And if you would cut, our, cut the system open and look in the cross section, you would see the active components, which are all the little squares that we put in there, and the glue layer. And then you would see wires running up and down, above and below those devices that interconnected everything and really made the system work. 
And then you would see a couple layers, one at the top and one at the bottom with much larger features that connected everything out to the outside world. And all of this was within the thickness of one to two human hairs, depending on the complexity of that system. And one of those assemblies of active devices in a layer with all the interconnect above and below it, we started to call those sub-modules because we realized that in order to make a complete system, we had to stack multiple sub-modules to get to the capability of a real computer. So that's what we did. So here you see an example of a complete little computing system that's about the size of a tiny postage stamp, and it's the thickness about half of a dime. And this one contains a stack of four submodules. So the bottom line is, by going to the silicon wafer as our platform, working out all the material challenges, working out all those big components and inventing new ones so that everything we had could fit inside the wafer, we were able to make everything come together in just a few years and push that metric another couple of orders of magnitude. And we met our Scrabble tile vision. So where do we go from here? If we've really squeezed all the volume we possibly could out of computing systems, then the only way we can improve now is to improve the capability. So this picture here is not the ENIAC. It's a modern day data center. Modern day data centers, of course, support all of the computing and communication we do on our smartphones and on our computers in the cloud, across the internet. And so the capability embodied in this picture is amazing. Yet, it still takes up an entire room. So we're kind of back to the ENIAC problem. So what could we do to get a portable data center? Well, think about the human brain. The human brain has about a million neurons and about a billion synapses or interconnections. This data center doesn't come anywhere close to that. And yet the brain, of course, fits in our heads. So it's something we carry around every day. We don't really quite understand how that works yet, but we're getting there, we're making progress, partly due to the miniature electronics that we've developed that can actually interface with brains and take data as people are thinking. So between understanding how brains work and groups of people around the world working to model synaptic activity, maybe within our lifetime, maybe within our children's lifetime, we can actually make something that has the capability of a human brain, that's the size of a human brain.